Hi, this is Giles Obrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast, featuring one of Swedish guitar great Ingve Malmsteen's very first interviews in America. At the time of this conversation, Ingve was 20 years old, and the night before had finished his first round of shows with Alcatraz. I'd first heard his playing on a demo cassette he'd made in Sweden called Rising Force. Soon after that, Ingve was profiled in Mike Barney's Spotlight column in the February 1983 issue of Guitar Player magazine. Mike arranged for Ingve to come to the United States to make a record with a band called Steeler. Ingve stayed in the States afterwards and formed Alcatraz with singer Graham Bonnet. There was a lot of buzz about Ingve's unique and brilliantly played neoclassical style. So in November 1983, Photographer John Sievert and I attended what was supposed to be an Alcatraz concert at Wolfgang's in San Francisco. As fate would have it, Graham Bonnet was too ill to sing that night, so Ingve played an instrumental set with a bassist and a drummer. John and I went backstage afterwards. It was very crowded, and after a while, Ingve finally came out. He spotted me and came right over and he said, Chas Ulbricht. I learned to read English to read your articles in Guitar Player magazine. I must have flashed John a look of disbelief because Ingve immediately followed up by saying, No bullshit. September 1980 BB King issue. You're in the t-shirt ad on page 71. Sure enough, that was true. As it turned out, Ingve was a huge fan of the magazine, which certainly helped when it came time to do the interview. We agreed to do it as soon as Ingve took a break from touring. A few weeks later, Alcatraz had 10 days off, and I accepted Ingve's invitation to call him at his apartment in Los Angeles. As you'll hear, he was bright, articulate, upfront, and very passionate about his music. Here's the first half of our 90 minute interview, which took place on January 3rd, 1984. As you'll hear, Ingve had a lot of information to share with other guitarists. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, we finally got together. Yeah, I've been a little bit busy. I just came up off the road now, uh, yesterday. Oh, you got a couple days off? Yeah, we, yeah, I've got like 10 days off. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, the photos came out well. The live photos? Yeah. Oh, really? That's interesting. So that's good. Well, I was really impressed by uh, the Alcatraz album and by your show. Well, thank you. You've really come a long ways. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it is what it is. Do you know, do you have a good idea what you're doing in musical terms? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, what's the extent of your musical education or knowledge? Uh, it's uh, basically pretty much limited as far as reading goes. I'm not very good at reading, but I know uh, most of the theory, basically everything actually, uh, as far as theory goes, you know, what what's, what keys are related or what scales, you know, could all you, that stuff. Could you describe the uh, scales you most frequently use? I use a lot of harmonic minor uh-huh. uh, and also diminished uh-huh. and uh, frigid. Oh, yeah? That's what I use most of the time. Well, we may as well get to the beginning. When did you first start playing? Uh, when I was around seven or eight years old, I started playing guitar. What's your birthday? Uh, June 30th. What year? 1963. Young guy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what inspired you to take up guitar? Um, it's kind of a long story because my mother, I'm the youngest child in the family. My mother kept on giving me instruments. Uh, all the time, because she wanted me to play, because my brother and my sister started playing with it, you know, when they were like three or four years old. And she kept on giving me trumpets and guitars and stuff. And when on my, on my fifth birthday, she gave me a guitar, and uh, wanted me to start playing guitar. And I didn't start playing guitar, and she, she put me in the uh, piano schools and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, it never happened really. Uh, but when I was, as I said, around seven or eight years old, I think it was, yeah, somewhere in between there, uh, I saw Jim Hendrix on TV. And uh, that was really, that turned me off a whole lot. Uh, oh, I mean, <laughs> that made me, you know, think it was really cool. 
cool to play guitar, you know? Uh-huh. As a kid, you, you think it's cool to be a soldier or a policeman or something, you know? And I thought Jimi Hendrix, he was like a hero type of guy. And I want to be like him. So um, I, took, I took the guitar down off the wall and started playing, basically. Is this an acoustic? Yeah, it was just an acoustic, but uh, I converted it into an electric or, you know, guitar. And uh, how much time did you spend when you were first starting? Uh, I remember that I, I was kind of, you know, I, I played and played until, you know, my fingers got all, you know, sore and I put a uh, band-aid on my fingers and kept on playing and I broke the first string and I kept on playing on the, the other five and I broke one more. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, I remember that actually. And I also had a pickup in it. I, I bought a pickup, it cost about two bucks. Uh-huh. And I played it through an old tube radio. Oh, boy. Yeah, so, you know, and I played through records, you know, um, some old Beatles records and some other Swedish stuff I had. And I eventually, uh, 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 when I was, I think, nine years old, I got a Deep Purple record in my as a birthday present. And that was, from then on, I was totally into Richie Blackmore. Uh, Do you remember which album it was? Yeah, it was Deep Purple Fireball. Fireball? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, that have, uh, unfortunately, been haunting me. <laughs> through my career that everybody tells me that means Richard Blackmore. Uh, I think though, especially for you, you know, like guitar plays, I don't think I play like Richard Blackmore at all. I don't either, actually. Uh, I don't, but um, keep, people keep on telling me that, which is very frustrating because I'm trying to explain for them that I don't play like him at all. Uh, but I was, as I said, very inspired by him in the beginning. When uh -huh. I started, you know, I bought my first electric guitar and stuff. Electric guitar. When right? did you get your electric? I bought it from my brother. It was... Um, Japanese copy of some sort. It was called Clear Sound or something. And it looked like a left-handed Stratocaster. It oh, looked like boy. the underhorn, you know, the under cutaway was like longer than the upper one. Really uh -huh. weird. <laughs> huh. um, I had just one pickup in it, you know. So did you learn chords and lead uh, solo playing uh, at the same time? No, I actually, uh, I started out just playing leads. You know, I didn't know how to play chords at all. I didn't even know how to tune the guitar for about one year. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, my brother eventually, uh, he taught me how to um, tune the guitar and also to play some chords. And, uh, you know, it, from there on it went. As I, as I said, I, the, the, more, the longer I played, the more I played. So it ended up like for about eight years, I played like nine hours a day. And uh, I found out, you know, logically a lot of things that I later read and I found out but you know instead of uh, getting taught that you know some some of the theories most of the theories really about you know relative scales and everything I found that out myself by listening you know mm -hmm. and I saw the patterns on the guitar and then you know I found out that you know that's what everybody does I thought I was the only one to do that <laughs> did you take lessons yeah I did after a long well when I've been playing for about six years or so five years or something like that I, I took uh, classical guitar lessons for about two years when you were 12 or 13 yeah. Was that with uh, somebody in Sweden? Yeah. Where did you, does that, did you learn to speak English as a kid? No, I, no. When did that happen? Well, I started sp speaking English uh, when I came here. In the last year or so? Yeah, February last year. You've done an amazing job. You speak it better than some people who've been here all their lives. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I used to read guitar player. <laughs> oh, yeah? In Sweden, yeah. You know, I used to read English. But I never spoke English, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Uh, now, uh, what did you think was, what was your goal? And when you were growing up and playing all this time, what did you envision yourself doing? Um, actually, the, most of the time was just to get better, which is actually, it still is. You know, I just keep on trying to get better. I always try to explore some stuff I haven't tried before. Uh, I also had a lot of dreams about, you know, being a star and all that stuff, but that was secondary. That what the most important to, thing to me was always the music, not not the money or, you know, anything. It was always the music, and that was, well, it still is. Uh -huh. that's, that's the only thing that really matters. Which guitarist after Blackmore uh, came to have an influence on you? Uh, after I started, after that, I, you know, I went more and more into classical music. I, I, you know, <clears throat> because uh, that was kind of Blackmore turned me on to that. 
to classical stuff. Uh-huh. But I thought that, you know, he he played classical stuff, but he, he got kind of limited. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I went back to the roots instead, you know. So I kind of, at, at one point, you know, I stopped listening to Richie and I, I stopped listening to guitar players at all, as a matter of fact. I think there's a lot of good, excuse me, I think there's a lot of good guitar players and I respect all, you know, there's so many good guitar players, but uh, there's, not really any guitar player that inspired me that much as Richie Blackmore. And after that, uh, it was just like Bach, you know, and also, if you know, Nicola Paganini. Yeah. His way of playing the violin was very, you know, that was kind of the way I wanted to play the guitar. Uh, that's still a, a goal for me, actually, to play stuff that most rock guitar players never play. Uh-huh. Uh, you know. I think, as I said, there's a lot of good guitar players, Eddie Van Halen, Gary Moore, and, you know, all those guys, they're extremely good, but they didn't really make me want to sound like them, I think, you know? Yeah, you don't either, which is good. What were your earliest bands? Um, I, I, I played in bands almost at the same time uh, as they started playing guitar, because my, my brothers played, played the drums, and I played with him uh, up until, you know, then I started forming like, you know, small bands in school and stuff. But um, I would say the first kind of successful Swedish band I had was called, uh, band was called Rising Force. Did they record any records? No. Uh, that's the one where, where Varney uh, wrote about you being in. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. It was kind of, not really a band, actually. It was, uh, I had a four track machine and I played all the parts and, you know, the drums and there's always lead singing and everything and I wrote all the kind of all kinds of stuff and it's really amazing because in a lot of places we play a lot of people know those tapes and stuff but you were the only member of Rising Force no I wasn't but um, you know I, I was kind of um, I was kind of Rising Force so to speak I had band members but they didn't do anything except just playing their parts you taught them their parts yeah what instruments do you play well enough to appear on stage with besides guitar? Uh, well, I can play bass, of course. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say, actually, I can play drums, but I don't know if I would, would you know, like to be on stage with it. You know, I can play decent drums. Can you play keyboards? No. I mean, I know, I know to play a couple of chords, you know, some lines and some parts of classical pieces and stuff, but, you know, it's, it's no, I wouldn't say I'm able to play keyboards the way a keyboard player should play. Was there, now, when did you leave uh, Rising Force in Sweden? Uh, I left Rising Force one month before I left Sweden. When, or, uh, or rather, just I just uh, kind of uh, broke the band up, so to speak, you know? Why did you do it? Uh, because it was so frustrating to... to uh, I could never reach a point of, of uh, for instance, fina- financial. I had a lot of problems uh, with that, you know? It was uh-huh. extremely hard to... to uh, earn any money on being a musician in Sweden. First of all, you, you almost have to play a certain kind of music, and I didn't. And you have to sing in Swedish, and I didn't. So the closest thing that happened to, you know, was that we recorded a single for CBS that never got released. We uh-huh. recorded three numbers uh, in one of the absolutely best studios, you know, very famous produce and everything, you know, and that was the best, that was the peak of, of that Rising Force thing, uh-huh. but that just, um, you know, ran out in the sand or whatever, because uh, they wanted us to do to, to Swedish lyrics on top of that, and I said no. Oh, you don't want to, you didn't want to do any Swedish lyrics? No, so that didn't happen. Were you aiming for the English-speaking market, in other words? I was aiming for selling records all over the world. They, they just want to sell records in Sweden, and that doesn't make sense to me. Because there's 8 million people in Sweden, and maybe 1 million people that buy records overall, and there's maybe like 200,000 people that would buy my record. And I would never be able to do anything with that. Is there much of a metal scene in Sweden? No, not at all. What was the name of uh, the single you cut? Uh, I never got a name or anything. It was, just, it, was, it was supposed to be called Rising Force, and it was three numbers. Uh, we recorded those. One side was called uh, You're Gonna Break Them All, and the other one was called Horizons. Very, very commercial material. Most, yeah. mo- more commercial than, than any Rising Force stuff I ever did. But I did it because I wanted to do some kind of record type of thing. Uh, are, are, are there very many uh, heavy metal guitar players in Sweden? No, not very many. There are a few, uh, actually. 
Are any of them, uh, are there any you could mention as being among the better ones? Mm, well, how should I explain? It, there is a few that they really try hard, you know, because it's very easy to get instruments in Sweden and stuff. It's probably easier even than getting them here. Uh-huh. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? Yeah. But um, a lot of music stores and a lot of people that get electric guitars and stuff, but there is, I wouldn't say there is any that I think are really good. You know. Yeah. Did the major metal bands tour Sweden when you were there? No. no. Oh, you mean the, the the foreign ones like Rainbow and stuff? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. There, there was kind of a every now and then was a heavy metal band there. All right. What did, can you hear a difference between an American and a European heavy metal guitarist? Most of the time, yes. What's the difference? Um. Well, I think most European guitar players have more melody. Uh-huh. And more, more uh, for instance, Mike Koshenka, I think, is very tasty. Right. You know, whereas, um, let me see. Whereas, for instance, Eddie Van Halen is more of a flashy guitar player. He doesn't play melody. Yeah. You know, it's more like, uh, you know, which is good, too, but that's the difference. Uh-huh. But, you know, not maybe all of them, but that's, you know, in general, maybe. Do you hear a difference between uh, the German guitars and the English guitars? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, I think German guitar players have more of a classical, you know, and uh, English more rock, so so to speak. The their way of playing, you know, for instance, uh, certain, you know, you play a certain lick on the neck, you know, whatever. It's, you know, it's hard to explain, really. Uh-huh. Uh, it's more of a scale type of thing. The, the German, you know, like the that kind of European stuff, than um, blues lick, you know, mm-hmm. rather English, I think. They, you know. Were you very familiar with Ulrich Ross? I think he's great, yeah. I think he's probably one of the most respectful guitar players around. Now, how did you happen to come to the U.S., or why? Uh, okay, that was because, I, as I said, I read every number of guitar player. And I was for a long, long time thinking about sending something to you, you know, for uh-huh. a long time. It was, yeah, well, five years ago. Um, but it never happened, you know, really, because I thought, well, they, they wouldn't even listen to it. Or anything. But then I saw this little column with um, Mike Varney, right? Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. So I just sent him a tape. And, um, you know, he called me back and he said he liked it very much and stuff. And he wanted me to come over to America. And, you know, do some kind of solo thing on uh-huh. his label, you know. And, uh, you know, and that sounded, of course, great to me, you know. Yeah. Uh, but um, eventually it, it took so long for me to get all the, this, um, the visas and all that stuff together that um, when it was time for me to leave, I already had, like, a lot of offers, you know, from other places. Yeah. And a lot of letters from Hawaii, I even I got an offer from Biden in Hawaii. Uh, was that because of the article? Or that they... No, yeah, oh yeah, I think so, but they also have heard me. See, the, the, the thing is, it's really weird, uh, a lot of people have had heard me before they saw the article, but they didn't know how to reach me, okay? Oh, you were just people had talked about you? Or how had they heard of you? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know, you see, because uh, um, there's somebody brought a tape over to America without me knowing it. Oh, and that tape has been floating around, and Mike Varney heard me one year before he got the tape I sent him. Oh, yeah? Yes, but he didn't get, know how to get the hold of me, right? So, um, oh, I see. But when I sent him my tape, I sent him all the addresses and stuff, and it, my address was also in the guitar player. Right. Issue. So that's why I got a lot of letters from that stuff, I think. Oh, I see. And, uh, but, yes, whatever happened was that Steeler, you know Steeler? Yeah. They called me up and they, they asked me to join their band. And uh, they were going to record an album on, on Mike Varney's label. And I thought, well, you know, I'd rather join a band and play live a lot and get a lot of exposure. Yeah, Than sure. just do a solo thing and, you know, not be able to play or tour or anything. So, I, you know, I, I joined Steeler. I What's, came to America and joined Steeler. What city were they out of? Well, they were located in L.A., right here. In L.A.? Yeah, so when I came, I moved to L.A., but they all come from different places. Did they have an album out before the Varney one? No, I think they had a, they had a single. 
Oh, so you had to come over and learn to speak English at the same time? Yeah, well, I had some problems in the beginning, really. Uh, some lack of communication, uh, for instance. People thought that I meant something I didn't mean, and, you know, I had a lot of fights and stuff for that, you know. <laughs> people got mad at me, but, you know, I, I kind of knew how to speak English, you know. But um, still, though, it's really hard to adapt to another language because all the words come in different order, for instance, you know. Yeah, I know the words. You tend to feel a bit limited and unintelligent because you think in one language and you have to interpret that and say something else. Do you still think in Swedish? No, I, well, I, both. I, you know, most of the time when I speak English, I think in English. Oh, I see. How much time did you spend with Steeler before the album was recorded? I think something like two months. What did you um, contribute as far as writing and arranging? I. Uh, I would like to to, to uh, have contributed uh, whatever. whatever. <laughs> I would have liked to write much more than I did, but um, still had some uh, sort of a leader, and that was the singer. And he had a strict idea of what he thought was supposed to be, you know, whatever is good. But uh, so I didn't get very much onto that record, even though I wrote quite a lot of stuff during that period. But you know, he wouldn't allow to have it on there because he had his stuff in. You know, he kind of wrote all, I wrote, uh, I think, two numbers and, um, and what, the solo, you know. Yeah, why did that solo have a name on the record? Because Mike Vaughn didn't want to pay for publishing. You're kidding. No. What was the name? He's, of Mike Vaughn is a great guy, but he's, he's really, uh, well, I, I can, it has a long story, really, the way he can, you know, uh, do things, you know, certain things, it's really weird. Now, do you have the right to that solo still? In other words, could you put that on an album? Uh, I don't know. Huh. Did you have a name for the solo? I, w I, w I wanted to call it Rising Force, but, uh, you know. It's funny they don't even mention it on the on the album anywhere. It's, it's probably the best track. Yeah. Well, I see, I don't... I was never very much into Steeler, you know. I, I never liked the band or anything. Yeah. yeah. So um, I didn't really care. By the time that album was released, I was out of the band. I left the band already. Oh, I see. Now, on that album, did you have a free hand with the solos? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Did you play the steel string guitar, too? Yeah. And did you have any favorite tracks on that? Oh, uh, I think No Way Out and Abduction and uh, Serenade. And then my solo, of course, I like. I think I like my solo better than anything else on that record. <laughs> was, that, but, uh, was that a solo you used to do in concert in Sweden? Yeah, sort of. No, actually not. I never used to do solos on stage in Sweden. No? No. I do now, but I never used to do it in Sweden. It's kind of a new thing for me, you know. Oh, boy, it must be fun, huh? Yeah. What was the equipment you used on that album? I used two Marshall heads and... Uh, I think I used only four Stratocasters. Four? Yeah. Normally I used more than that, but you know. Huh. Did you ultimately find the band was too limiting? Oh, yes. Very much so, yeah. Okay. They, they, they uh, you know, intentionally they worked against melody. What do you mean? They, they worked against being melodic in the band. And that's, that's, to me, that's the total opposite of what you're supposed to do. To me, music is melody. Right? Uh huh. I, and, you know, I write melodic stuff. And, you know, I was trying to write some stuff for them, but they, you know, they, they, they wanted to play like really, you know, limited, you know, no melody bullshit, you know? Yeah. And that, that it didn't work. You know, I was, from the kind of day one, I didn't want to be in that. But I didn't have very much of a choice, really. I mean, came from Sweden, I didn't know anybody, didn't have any money, anything, didn't have anywhere to live. You know, I just had to do what I had to do. Yeah. So how long in total did you spend with Steeler? I think three months. Oh, really? Yeah. That's not very long at all. So you cut the album. Did it take long to record the album? Pardon? Did it take long to record the album? I recorded all my parts in one day. For the whole album? Yeah. Jesus. That's amazing. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's simple stuff, you know? Yeah. No, it's really what, simple. What happened uh, after you t you quit that band, Steeler? Um, from, as I said, from day one, I was not very much interested in the band. But So uh, I started to look for something else. And um, 
I, I got kind of, you know, a few offers and stuff. And as a matter of fact, the last concert I ever did with Steeler, Phil Mogg was there. You know, Phil Mogg from UFO. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, he was in the, con- the concert and I spoke to him, you know, backstage after the show. And we had, you know, we decided that we, sh- we were going to get together and try to work something out, you know, because, you know, he needed a guitar player, just left UFO and blah, 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 you know. And uh, it sounded great to me, you know, have a more of a major gig kind of thing. Uh, you know? But what happened? So the next day, well, you know, after that gig, but I was, you know, the next day, which was supposed to be the day I was going to speak to Tim Long, I was sleeping uh, at a friend's house, you know, staying in a friend's house. And uh, uh, he woke me up, my friend woke me up, you know, he came into my room and said, you know, uh, Graham Bonnet's manager on the phone. And I go, what? Graham Bonnet? You know, what are you talking about? You know, because I was into the Phil Mogg thing. And I, I, you know, just out of the blue, like Phil Graham Bonnet's manager is calling me. Uh-huh. So whatever happened was, I, you know, I spoke to this manager, and um, he said that uh, he wanted me to be down at the rehearsal place in the one hour. And, okay, well, it was, you know, so I went down to that place, and I played with them for about, you know, whatever, two or three hours. Uh-huh. And they, they wanted me to join the band, and I also wanted to join the band. I thought it was great. But I had in my back head that I wanted to check the Phil Mogg thing out, too. So I told them that, okay, I'll tell you, like, 11 o'clock tonight, I'll tell you. So I had to go. Then I went to Phil Mogg's house. Mm-hmm. I was sitting there, and, you know, having a few beers and hamburgers and stuff. You know, it was like in one day I had to choose, you know, between those two guys. And, you know, I think I did the right thing because... Uh, Phil Mogg is, is more of a laid-back kind of guy, you know, I, you know, I'm really, you know, a workaholic kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I, I want to play, you know, and rehearse and write all the time, you know. But he's more like a, a party kind of guy. Yeah. You know, and also that when I joined Alcatraz, they didn't have one song. Now, they had, was this their first album, the one you're on? Oh, yeah. They didn't have a name even, you know. The, the lineup on it wasn't even... Were you familiar with Graham Bonnet? Oh, yeah. You knew about his work with Rainbow and with uh, Shanker? Shanker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened? How did you guys put the music together for Alcatraz? Uh, I wrote the music and he wrote the lyrics. Uh, how long did that take? How did, did About three you, weeks. Did you guys I, I, wrote, I wrote all the music in three weeks. The lyrics, he kind of wrote at the same time he, he put the tracks down. Oh, really? Yeah. I think, at least. I don't know, because uh, we didn't really work together. See, I wrote all the music and most of the melody lines for the vocals and stuff, but uh, um, he wrote all the lyrics, and I don't know when or where he did it, because we didn't really sit down together and do it, you know? You just gave him a tape? Well, yeah, just showed him the song. Oh, I see. You know? How much rehearsing? Did you guys rehearse every day almost, or...? Yeah, we rehearsed, rehearsed almost... Four, well, kind of four weeks before we did the album. You know. Uh huh. But you know, and we at the same time we we're auditioning drummers. At the same time we we're trying to get the band together. Amazing. You know, so it was kind of hard work. But did you have a lot of these melodies before? Some of the stuff is from Rising Force. Uh huh. But uh, <coughs> most of it is totally new. It was more of a challenge for me to try to create something new. Uh huh. Yeah. But. Uh, for instance, Krina Corey is, is basically a Rising Force tune. Was it, now, how many, was uh, Rising Force a trio? Yeah, so most you, of the time. Sometimes it was uh, five people, sometimes it was four, sometimes it was three. Did you have two guitarists at any time? At, at one point I had uh, a rhythm guitar player. Uh, as, I, I didn't say before, but I had about 25 or 30 different lineups in that band. Oh, boy. When was Rising Force around? What years? Uh, 78. 82. Late, I like it. December 82. Were there bands before Rising Force? That I was in? Yeah. Yeah, I had the same kind of type of thing, but it was not like, you know, same thing, you know. It was called Powerhouse. Powerhouse? Yeah. One word? Yeah. Uh-huh. That was kind of... When was that? That was pre-78? Yeah, between 76 and 78. Was there any bands before then? Uh, with names and stuff? Yeah, <laughs> it was just like Toy Town kind of thing, you know? Toy Town? Yeah. That was the name of it? No, but you know, it was like that. 
Joy you know, we kids, you know. Oh, yeah. I think, I think one, of them, one of them was called Burn. Burn? Yeah. Like the name of the Deep Purple album? Yeah. Uh-huh. Another band I think was called Power. Were, you, were those bands cover bands, or have you always been into the original side of things? Uh, we were mostly original, but we also played uh, Deep Purple stuff. And, uh-huh. you know, Jimi Hendrix and you know, all kinds of stuff he played. Was the was guitar player much of a help? The magazine? I always loved that magazine. I thought it was great. Um, as I said, I, I don't know if you remember, but I said backstage when I met you, I, I had almost all the ones from 75 to 76 or something up until uh, 82. Almost every issue. No kidding. I didn't even know you could get it in Sweden. Oh, yeah. Huh. You can go to... Uh, almost buy it at McDonald's. No, but you know, you can get it almost everywhere. No kidding. Uh, I'm glad you know that. Sweden is, is probably much more uh, civilized than most people seem to think. Oh, you I, know, it's I like think, a small America. I know? think people think of it as being more civilized than the U.S. Because uh, there's little crime and the people seem mellower and better standard of living. Yeah. I've well, always thought that. Yeah, well, actually, there, there's, yeah. Kind of right. Honest in the band? Oh, yeah. I don't like to play with other guitar players. <laughs> well, uh, now, uh, were you happy with the way the album came out, Alcatraz? Yeah, most of it, yeah. Most of it is, uh, I think, very good. What, is, what, what were your favorite tracks? Uh, Too Young to Die, The Drunk to Live. That's uh-huh. one of my favorite ones. And, of course, Queen and Corey. When I wrote... Um, a song called Bigfoot. When I wrote that one, that was one of my absolute favorite songs. But um, the way it turned out on the album, you know, the production, you know, some of the production is, is not what I want it to be. Yeah. You know, it's kind of too light. Too huh. much keyboards. Don't print that. <laughs> oh, I understand what you're saying. It's kind of, I think your band could do, could go without keyboards if you had to. I do too, actually. Um, yeah. It's kind of an overdone thing, really. Yeah, you don't need that texture that much, you know? There's a couple of spots where it's cool, but... Uh, it fills out some sp- spots, you know? Yeah. But uh, at the same time, if it's too much, it's, it uh, it loses the effect. Yeah. I think a keyboard player in the kind of band we are shouldn't play all the time. Yeah, it, you know sh- yeah, it should be the way... Uh, um, yeah, it should just be a texture once in a while. Yeah. You shouldn't print that either because my keyboard player is going to kill me. But, I won't. Yeah. You know. <laughs> How did you record that album? Which tracks did you, what part did you lay down first? On the dark uh, tracks? Yeah. Uh, most of the time I just put down the, the rhythms first. Sometimes I put, put down the leads and the rhythms at the same time. You did know, like tr- live kind of thing. Did the bass and drums play at the same time or did you do each? Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Uh, the way we played, we recorded, I used, you know, like a Rockman amp. Yeah. The whole band recorded the whole album like that live, okay? Explain. Yeah, everybody sat down in the studio and the drums were playing and the bass was, went into the board and the keyboard went into the board and I went to the, into the board with the Rockman. And that, in that, you know, fashion, we recorded the whole album like that. Um, all the tracks, like the drum tracks, basically. And then we redid everything except the drums. We oh. did the guitar. We took the Rockman track out. We took the keyboard track out, you know, and some of the bass parts I think we did also. Is that Rockman you're talking about the uh, little, like, uh, effects thing? Yeah. The Tom Schultz Rockman? Yeah. Oh, and then you took that out and re-recorded the parts with amps? With Marshalls, yeah. Oh, what was your setup? Those uh, two Marshall heads, four cabinets in the studio. The 100 watt heads? No, 50s. 50s? Yeah, old 50 watt heads. Do you use uh, effects devices? Oh, uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I do. I uh, use a Roland Echo unit. Uh-huh. And, which is, you know, the cheaper... The, I think that you can't buy them anymore. It's called DC-10. Oh, sure. It's really cheap, you know. But uh, it, it sounds pretty good. I've been using that for years and years. And I also used um, a Vox Flanger. Uh-huh. For uh, some part. I, actually, I don't think I used that on the album. On the album, I don't think I used any effects at all, as a matter of fact. When I play live, I use some effects. Huh. What, what, what about the solos now? Um, did you have an idea what you wanted to do with the solos for each song? Did you 
you were? No, they just totally improvised. Really? Yeah, it's it's just like you know, okay, let's do a solo. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all first take improvised. You know, everything. No kidding. No. Did you do any splicing? No. No kidding. That's amazing. No, it's not. It's it's kind of live. You know, it's it's really live. You play very emotionally. How do you psych yourself up in the studio? Um, you know, I just play along with the track, so to speak, you know, and by the time I come up to the solo, it's like I'm psyched up enough, you know. You what? Yeah, oh yeah. But I didn't hear the last part. Pardon? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I said that when I play along with the track in the studio, uh-huh. by the time I get to the solo part, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of, I like it, you know, how should I say, it's exciting enough for, you know, putting enough feeling into it, you know. It's, you know, I think feeling is the most important, uh, it, at least for me, since I'm improvising all the time. If I don't, you know, have a good feeling, uh, I wouldn't be able to pull off a good solo. You know? What's your philosophy of soloing? What do you think a solo should do? Um, I think it should be interesting. Uh-huh. I think it should be, it depends on the song, really. If, if it's, uh, sometimes it should be flashy. Sometimes it should be, you know, um, even, of course, yes, <laughs> it's hard to say, but even though it's flashy, it should never l- lose the, the melodic touch, you know? It should always be melodic. You know, that's, I think, okay, that's it. That's it. That's the answer. We'll look for in the solo. It's always been melodic. Doesn't matter if it's fast or slow. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It has to be melodic. Do you ever? Uh, what's your? Um, when you're going to take a solo, how do you construct it? Do you uh, think in terms of scales or in terms of the chords, or don't you think at all? Or what happens? When I play, I don't think, but uh, I have kind of. I think subconscious. In my subconscious, I know what I'm doing. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't play in D minor if, if the song is in C minor, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I know what I'm doing on the neck, but I don't really think about it. Yeah. It's like a second nature thing, you know? Uh-huh. So, um... Can you play everything you imagine? I don't think so, no. No? Uh, that's probably what, that's my goal, you know? to be able to play anything, but of course that, you know, will probably never reach that point, but you know, you know, if you work on it, you, you will get closer to it, you know what I mean? You know, I, I, for instance, I don't want to be technically limited, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, feel that I am not able to do a special, you know, a certain thing, even though I, I, I'm not able to do everything, of course, nobody is, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things I can't do, but I want to feel that I'm still working on it, you know? You know? Do you play in any guitar styles that aren't on the albums? Oh, I can play blues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but really, um, uh, I don't know anything about jazz, if that's what you want to know. Yeah. No, I can't play jazz at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you give, um, offer uh, players any advice on how to escape repetitious soloing patterns? Um. Well, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. First of all, uh, you should know all the scales. You should only know a lick. Let's hear the scales you're talking about. Well, it depends on the chord progression or the song. Uh huh. You know, um, you should always be able to relate to what is happening in the actual song, in the rhythm section. If there is, um, you know, as that, for instance, I hear a lot of guitar players, they're just playing licks all the time, you know? I should explain, if you bend, for instance, the G string and you hold the, the forefinger on the, the, the B and the E, okay? And, you know, and you, how should I explain? Get the Chuck Berry lick? Yeah, yeah, but kind of a little bit more developed than that. But still, though, uh, if you're playing, for instance, B, you play in the seventh fret area. Right. You know what I mean? That's, That's the way most guys do it. Yeah. Whereas if I play in B, I play all of the neck. Doesn't uh-huh. matter which key I'm playing in, I'm still playing all of the neck. Uh-huh. Know. I'm playing different positions and different patterns, but it's still, uh, you know, first of all, I don't want to bore myself yeah. you know, when I play. And uh, if I bore someone else, then it's, it's really serious. Yeah, say, 
they say there's a guy who knows a lot of licks, but he doesn't know the first thing about music. What would you suggest should be the, the things he ought to start reading about and learning about? It, it depends on what kind of, you know, what uh -huh. they're looking for. Uh, me personally, I'm into the classical thing totally. You know, I know that if you listen to a lot of classical stuff, you don't really have to know what's going on. If you just listen to it and try to relate to it and try to adapt that, extremely logic, logical or whatever, uh, way of uh, building the music up, okay? And try to adapt it into your guitar playing or your songwriting. I think that's one of the best things you can do. That's what I've been doing. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it's like classical is everything for me. Not every, all, not all kinds of classical music. It's, it's basically Baroque, you know? Uh -huh. Because I think a lot of other classical music it tends to get, you know, out of hand. I like Bach is, is my god, you know, uh -huh. and that's the only thing I have to go after, you know. And if I want, you know, to suggest something, I think classical, you know, is who who's, you know, which classical composer is up to everybody, but for me it's Bach. But I think though classical is, that was the, the peak of the, the, the musical history of man, you know. The music ha hasn't developed since classical music kind of, stop being created, you know? Which Bach are you talking about? Oh, oh, everything that he ever wrote. Johann Sebastian? Oh yes, Johann Sebastian, of course. Okay, because there's a couple other ones too, right? Yeah, he's got a couple of sons, I think. Yeah. It's funny, Randy Rhodes was into the same thing. Bach and Paco Bell. Paco Bell? Paco Bell. Who's that? He was another Baroque composer, a little bit more obscure. It's P-A-C-H-E-B-E-L. Oh, I never heard of. Well, yeah. That's interesting. As far as extreme guitar playing, though, if you just don't want to get that extremely nice, beautiful melody thing, from, I say, you know, I get from Bach. But if you just want to have extreme guitar playing, and you know, it's, you should listen to Paganini. I mean, this guy, the twenty-four caprices of, from Paganini. I mean, that's extreme. Whatever he does on his violin, there is is. You know, there is no guitar player in the world that can do that. Have you ever tried to copy his violin stuff on guitar? I, I kind of, I don't go and play exactly what he's playing. Right. I get the vibe from his thing. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, I hear all kind of notes he's playing and stuff. And, you know, but he's playing one instrument, I'm playing another one. So I can't play exactly the way he does. But, you know, that's definitely one of the things I'm really working on. For instance, broken chord patterns, you know. You play every note in a chord or a scale kind of a thing, but you play on different strings and pick every note and you play extremely fast, up and down. Like, that's one thing that I think is very hard and I'm working a lot on that. What, what keeps most players from achieving the speed that you have, especially in your right hand? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know, really. Is most of your speed from your right hand? No, it's from the left hand. I think my my right hand is really dull. That one is, I need to work on that a lot. Huh. Yeah, I think the left hand is, is the one I have developed most. When you practice, what do you work on? I know it's gonna sound funny, but I never practice. I never did. What do you do? I just play. Uh -huh. I just enjoy myself, you know, and play. I, I never practice, I never sit down and play a thing slowly and faster and faster, or I never sit and, uh, kind of, you know, if, if there is one thing I feel I need to work on, I work on it in uh, a situation where it should be, not just like separately. So you've never like uh, come up with a solo before you had a song to put it in? Mm, well, it depends what you mean with a solo. Uh, for instance, if you listen to, um, what's it called now? Uh, Too Young to Die, Drunk to Live. What's there's, it? That's the first, I think, second or first track. Oh, right. Yeah. That's, um, I play a classical kind of arpeggio type of thing. Uh huh. Uh, it's a, it's a minor broken chord thing. And that's, I worked out before I wrote the song. Uh huh. Um, you know.
This concludes the first half of my 1984 interview with Ingve Malmsteen. The second part is available on YouTube as well, so click on over and check it out. And if you like what you hear, send some cheer our way by clicking that donate button. I'd like to thank Nick Hunt for producing this podcast, which is copyright 2023 by Jazz Obrecht, all rights reserved. Thanks for listening.